the escort carrier, or the jeep carrier, or the baby flat top, or any number of other nicknames you might choose to come up with. These were a kind of ship that came about in World War II. A sense of desperation and a need for as many carriers as one could get, even if the quality of those ships were lacking. When what mattered was getting planes to the front line, no matter how they got there. This was the kind of ship you wanted. When you needed air cover for slow convoys, and could hardly waste a fast fleet carrier, an escort carrier was there for you. When you were already tapping your industry to the breaking point building regular carriers, well, there were probably smaller yards that could handle a merchant ship with a flight deck and hangar strapped to the top. This being said, while the mimetic image of American shipyards printing them by the dozens is the common one, the origin of the concept comes from a different angle, from the other side of the Atlantic. You see, the British realized fairly early on, as in 1930s early, that they would need air cover for convoys. Surface raiders or submarines could be countered by surface ships, certainly, but being able to keep them away from the convoy in the first place could prove useful. And enemy aircraft could be a hypothetical threat, as German condors would show later on when war came. The issue was, no one wanted to waste a fleet carrier on such a task. These ships were far faster than the ships they would be escorting, and one never had enough of them to begin with, even before combat losses started. They were an expensive warship needed for offensive actions, not trawling the North Atlantic at 20 knots or less. Thus enters the idea of, well, we can convert passenger liners or freighters and have them play escort. While the British had ideas for five or so passenger liners early in the war, these would be held back because of a lack of planes and pilots for the fleet carriers, never mind escorts. This being said, when the need for convoy escorts became desperate, the British would change their tune somewhat. They took in a captured German merchant, the Hanover, and converted her to what can be considered the first true escort carrier, HMS Audacity. Older ships like Argus could be used in the role, but they were definitely not intended for the role. However, even Audacity's conversion took long enough that there were stopgap measures such as strapping a single-use hurricane to a catapult on a freighter's bow. Or, quite literally, strapping a flight deck and nothing else on top of merchant ships, not even bothering to actually take them into full military service, because they could only manage four or so swordfish. While all these emergency methods kinda sorta worked, they were only ever an emergency thing. And if Audacity would only see short service, a couple months before you both sank her, she pointed the way to the future. Of course, with British industrial capacity stretched to the breaking point and beyond, they turned to the United States to actually build these ships for them. It must be said, though, that during this entire process, the USN was already contemplating converting merchant ships into small carriers. Only on their side of the Atlantic, the initial idea was for training purposes. Admiral Halsey in particular was pushing for this. Alternatively, they were also thinking of aircraft transport roles. This can be seen in their initial designation, AVG, Auxiliary Aircraft Escort Vessels. Or, on the same note, in their second designation, Auxiliary Aircraft Carrier, ACV. Both of those are auxiliary roles. They're transports, they're training, they're not actual warships. It was only when these early ships proved themselves very good for convoy escort, being about the same speed as convoys, that they got moved up to their more familiar calling card, CVE, Escort Carrier. While USS Long Island, the first of the type, was something of a rush job, later ones began to become more standardized. The first few were conversions of existing merchant hulls, though this would only continue from Long Island and the Avengers, through the Bogues and into the Sangamon class. That last one being built on the hulls of Oilers. This led to some quirks, such as being the largest of the type, or having all the machinery, and by extension the smokestacks, at the stern. The most notable thing there, though, is that as converted Oilers, they still had the ability to carry fuel for their escorts in a way that other escort carriers couldn't. Through all of these ships, the Americans would lend lease quite a few of them to the Royal Navy, with the exception of the Sangamons, 
the British, again, being the ones to request this in the first place, and quite desperate for ships they couldn't really build themselves. The last two classes built by American shipyards, though, were different. For example, the Commencement Bay class were purpose-built escort carriers. While, yes, they still follow the trend of being built on modified tanker hulls, they were built as CVEs from the keel up. The design was based on a tanker hull, but the ships were built as their own thing. The Casablanca class took it another step. Those were a full-on purpose-built design, which did allow for the rather absurd ramp-up in production they pulled off here. Because the Casablanca class, all 50 of them, were built between mid-1943 and mid-1944. This is no mean feat of engineering, though it did come with some sacrifices in regards to their engine power. Even so, it shows that, regardless of these limitations, escort carriers were able to be built in fairly ludicrous numbers by American industry. Again, there were sacrifices made here, but the ships gave excellent service during the war. While only able to carry about two dozen planes each, though it did vary, these ships would be used to their fullest. U-boats and air attack would have difficulty if an escort carrier group was around. If you needed to rapidly transport planes, escort carriers were perfect for that role. They weren't exactly fast ships, but they could fly the planes off when close to the destination. This is an understandable improvement compared to crated planes unloaded dockside, though escort carriers could do that as well. For a little while, the ships even performed the role of fleet or light carriers. It was a risky kind of service, but one they could perform at a stretch. All this being said, at least in American service, their most common offensive roles will be ground support actions. They could carry bombers and fighters, and these are fine for shooting up ground targets or escorting bombers to their marks. And in this role, escort carriers excelled as relatively cheap options that could be put out quickly. Though the crews were, as you could expect, aware of how cheap the ships were, considering the designation of CVE would often be twisted to mean combustible, vulnerable, expendable. Or, more darkly, Kaiser coffins. That being said, even Japan would, eventually, warm to the idea themselves. Albeit that they started relatively late to the party, only built a handful of them, and they were not quite as successful. Probably didn't help in this regard that a chunk of those were built and operated by the Imperial Japanese Army. Because if you ever have a question like, how far can inter-service rivalry really go, the Imperial Japanese military will always exceed your expectations. Those Army ships do rather stretch the definition of aircraft carrier to the breaking point, though. They were multi-role ships that could carry a handful of planes, and for the most part, didn't even see any service. The most famous of the bunch, Akitsumaru, would be torpedoed and promptly explode, taking over 2,000 men down with her. The Navy ships, on the other hand, were actually functional ships, insofar as they served roughly the same kind of role as escorts for convoys and aircraft transports as the Allied ships. They had broadly the same capabilities as Allied escort carriers as well. However, in stark contrast to American industrial power, Japan never had enough of the ships to use them like the USN did. While still faster than building a full-on fleet carrier, Japan proved incapable of building a lot of escorts off merchant hulls. Not helping this, of course, being American submarines preying on what merchants Japan did have. They never had enough transports as it was, so converting a ton of them to carriers was of questionable utility in any event. No other navy would operate escort carriers during the war, in any case. The Germans would try to convert some ships, but they never finished them. And the other Allied powers didn't operate any of the American swarm of escort carriers, at least during the war. So where does that leave us? Well, escort carriers were a very World War II invention, when a lot of ships were needed as quickly as possible. After the war ended, with a glut of fleet carriers in service, the very vast majority of the escorts were quickly decommissioned. Some were reconverted to merchant ships. A couple would find their way into being passenger liners on the Europe to Australia route, which must have been interesting for the people stuck aboard those. 
and some would linger on in secondary roles for a bit longer. No matter the case, their time in the sun had come and gone. There wasn't as much need for them with the grand battles of the Pacific or the convoy protection in the Atlantic gone. They served well, but they served short lives. Not the worst thing in the world, I suppose. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one.